Welcome to U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this local area. The National Farmers Organization takes pride in inventing a marketing system to meet our needs of the 20th century, collective bargaining for agriculture. NFO represents new thinking in a new generation of farmers. U.S. Farm Report presents observation of feedlots in the western states. Here is W.W. W. Butch Swaim, National Director of NFO Research and Public Information. Today on U.S. Farm Report, we have a number of distinguished guests, people that are actually raising cattle, feeding cattle, raising the feed for those cattle through irrigation, irrigated farming, and one gentleman in the dairy business, and one lady who is women's director of a television station, in this area, and I might say at this time that this is being filmed in Denver, Colorado, one of the probably best known cattle feeding areas in the United States. And I'd like to introduce my special guests, and then we'll come back and visit with them a little bit later. But to my immediate left, we have Alex Hoffner of Greeley, Colorado. Alex is a longtime cattle feeder, rancher, raising his own herd and buying others. Uh, also irrigated farming, producing his feed to fatten out those uh, cattle. Then to his left, we have Doris Berry, women's director of KTVS Television at Sterling, Colorado. And one of the important things for her being on today, we're now starting a series of television shows, not over, not only just on her station, but on Cheyenne, Wyoming, as well as Scottsbluff, Nebraska. And Doris Berry is one of the ones that was kind enough to help line up this time and has helped us in a number of ways. And I'm sure that she'll have some important things to contribute today. Thank then you. to her left is Wayne Ludwig from Torrington, Wyoming. And Wayne, again, is a cattle rancher, cattle feeder, irrigated farming, and does a little bit of everything in the farming way. And most certainly, if you're going to make money, you should be able to do it when you produce the feed, produce the cattle, fatten them out. Most certainly, <coughs> if anybody could make money, that type of an operation could. Then, to his immediate left, we have Richard Reinick of Kelsey, Colorado. Richard is, has a large, or a relatively large, dairy herd, uh, about 100 cow herds, milking about 65, I believe. Uh, he told me at this uh, all the time. Also, he has a beef herd and also uh, fattens out beef cattle. And he also has irrigated farming. And you can see that he has his hands full. Then, to his left, we have Virgil Sprague. Virgil is well known throughout Colorado, better known to his friends as Swede. He's also a large rancher, irrigated irrigation farming raising his own feed and fattening out uh, beef. Now, today, we're going to start off with Alex Hoffner here, to my immediate left. And Alex has been kind enough to bring along a lot of pictures of feedlots and has quite a few things that I'm sure you'll all be interested in. Alex? Well, <clears throat> to start with, I want to familiarize some of the people with uh, the feedlots in our area. In a radius of 10 miles of my home, at the present time, there are 225,000 head of cattle being fed or more. The lots will vary in size from 75,000 head on down, and several of them with 15 and 20,000. So we always talk about why are they so big. Now, I want to tell you why they're so big. The reason they have grown and expanded, I better get back to some of these feedlots a little first. The reason they have expanded, I've been in this business as long as some of those boys have, but I, they didn't have to stand a loss on growing a crop. The only loss they ever had to stand was what the feedlot lost. And whenever we get to the position that we will get the cost of production for this feed, this feeding will move back out on the farm where it belongs. Now, I'd like to have some of those pictures, if you start with. Now, 
This is just one of the feed lots in our area. They tell me there's about 75,000 on feed in that place. That is just a mile long from this end to the other, the length of the pitcher. Now I would like to show you some of the storage for feed. This one on, my, on your left there, you can just see the, it looks like a gravel pit there. That is a pit of Anslage, and that long strip over there is another pit. The long strip in the middle you're talking about, In the about, middle right? there. There is about 170,000 tons in those two holes. How many dollars would that represent, Alex? Oh, I never figured that. That'd be, make me dizzy. <laughs> now there is a, another pit. Uh, this on the extreme left is wet corn setup. One of those pits will hold uh, 6,500 tons about a quarter of a million dollars, there's a half a million dollars worth of wet corn in those two holes. The two on the left. One two on the left. The other, yes, and the other two sides, that is uh, insulage. Chopped corn. Chopped corn, as we call it. We call it insulage in our area. Now, there are some of pictures of some of the old-time feedlots. You notice they're not being in use anymore, and that man would surely feed 75 head to get financed. Now, let's move on to the next one. Next There's week. another one the same way. It, it's more a little modern, but you don't see much livestock in there. But year, 20 years ago, that's how our cattle were fed in our area. They were In my immediate area, I would say we have lost 75% of the small feedlot operators on account of finances and of account of uh, losses that had to be taken up in farming. Well, this is very good and very interesting because most certainly, if there isn't a profit in the farming operation, the family farm is going to be forced out. Of course, the corporate farm setup can stay for a while, but in time they will disappear too unless the price situation is corrected. So it has to be corrected. And many of those people are beginning to become aware of this, aren't they, and more willing that's, to help? That's right. And the, a lot of these sellers are friends of mine that own these big feed lots. In fact, I talked to one yesterday. And it, uh, it isn't, you can't blame these fellows. They've just took uh, advantage of the situation that occurred. And they, they could get the finances, and they growed with it. And this is, uh, this is why they've got big. And uh, I do believe that if the small farmer could have got finance, if uh, the whole thinking of our economy across the nation was uh, thinking of being bigger. The only way to survive was be bigger. I don't think these feedlots would have ever been built. Well, the big ones aren't doing so well either, are they? We have a lot of them, they tell me, that have their financial problems just the same as a small farmer or feeder. But he seems to have an outlet where he can hide all more money. More money. Maybe it's because he buys his cheap or his feed a little cheaper from the other fella, and like you pointed out, didn't take the loss on the feed. Well, I could add a little more to that for the simple reason. You, you take an average farmer, you give him the cost of production on his feed and let him feed those cattle, even if he lost his labor on feeding those cattle. He, you're still not going to break him. But when he has to absorb a loss on growing a crop, and then absorb another loss on, on cattle that he bought to put in that feedlot, it ain't going to take long because I know what I'm talking about because I'm in that business. You're in that business. Well, this is certainly good to have somebody with authority. Now we're going to move along to Doris Berry, uh, who was women's television director of television station at Sterling, Colorado. And Doris, you're in the business of putting on television programs and the business of operating or helping to operate a television. Think of all of the extra money or extra possibilities in your television station and for business people in your community if farm prices were restored, fair farm prices were restored, it would double the flow of money through all of rural America. Think what you could do. Give us a word on what you think this would mean to Sterling, Colorado, and other towns, USA, that might be affected. Thank you, Butch. I'm glad to have this opportunity. Uh, as you said, I am the women's director. Well, this is sort of like being the second lieutenant in the Army, you know, you do a little bit of everything. And uh, I am also a member of the sales staff of our station. And uh, you just hit uh, sort of a, a real <laughs> tender spot here because uh, Sterling, Colorado is, uh, I think, typical of many small communities uh, throughout rural America. 
and I'm thinking of uh, the additional advertising, the additional business that we could uh, have in our station. Now, I don't mean that we're going to make a lot of extra money out of this, but we'd make money. That's what we're all in business for, and I, I'm sorry to say that all you fellows aren't making money, you know? But nevertheless, if our station prospers, then the, the businesses in these small towns in rural America are going to prosper too, because we can do the job of selling for them. But without you, you uh, rural people that we completely re rely on, we, none of us are going to make any money. One reason we like to bring this out is because we like to show that everyone is concerned and everyone will support the National Farmers Organization as soon as they understand what it will do for the family farm or their community and all business in general. Because statistics of the United States government prove conclusively that every dollar of gross farm income turns into seven dollars of national income. So this is the reason why your community is feeling the pinch, and to restore it right, it would double the flow of dollars through rural America, USA, and in turn, for each dollar of gross farm income, and this is what the community lives off of, the gross farm income. The farmer, he has to live off of the net, but the community lives not only off the gross, but the net income, and this is what's, what's important right. to your television station. This is why all of the television stations throughout the Midwest here, virtually without exceptions, are supporting us to a certain extent, helping much more than they used to. Now we're going to move along again, and I want to come back to you again, Doris, later okay. on if we have time, to uh, Wayne <coughs> Ludwig, to her left, from Torrington, Wyoming. Wayne, uh, what do you, how do you see the picture and what has to be done to get this job uh, brought about to serve all of rural America the way it should be? Well, Butch, uh, uh, I think uh, myself that that our major problem today is an is a, is a educational one. I think that we simply must educate all of the people everywhere to the fact that we must organize. We must somehow or another, uh, so to speak, fight fire with fire. We live in a highly organized society. And uh, uh, in this organized society, people who are unorganized are simply batting their heads against a brick wall, so to speak. And I think uh, our major, the thing of most importance to, to us in NFO is, is a, a period of education, a period of adjustment for, for ourselves and, and the rest of the consuming public. In other words, what you're saying is that we all need to organize and understand each other's problem, organize together as farmers to bargain together and sell together, that the rural communities must be brought in on uh, to let them know what we're trying to accomplish so that they can see whereby they can gain also. Everybody in America would gain, possibly. Uh, might be an exception or two of, of a few of the people that might be a little extra greedy. But other than that, every single American would gain by fair farm prices. Because why do I say this? History records that using the American system with farm prices more or less in balance over the years, with agriculture uh, getting its fair share. By 1929, the United States of America made up only 6% of the people of the world. But yet we had generated and accumulated 50% of the entire wealth of the whole world. And this came from our agriculture commodities when they were receiving a fair price. Now they're deteriorating. America is reaching a danger point. Follow in the newspaper, and you'll know what I'm talking about. Now we're going to pass on to Richard Reinick over here from Kelsey, Colorado. Richard is in the dairy business, also has a beef cow herd. Richard, why don't you tell us your outlook on this situation? Well, Butch, I'd like to uh, go back up for a minute and kind of elaborate a little bit what Alec had mentioned here. Greeley is my hometown. Now, Alec had mentioned the fact that within 10 miles radius of his farm, you could pick up and see about 250,000 cattle in feedlots. Well, I took a compass the other night and took Greeley as the center point of my, my little area. And I drew a 12-mile circle out around the Greeley area. And as close as I could figure, 
I believe we could go out and see approximately 350,000 cattle in feedlots. Now this is not uh, range cattle, this is not dairy cattle, this is just cattle that are in the feedlots. So this will give you kind of an idea what kind of a concentration of livestock that we do have within the Greeley, Colorado area. Now naturally, with a situation like this, the first question that is asked is, can you produce enough feed within that area to feed this many livestock? Well, we cannot. In fact, we buy more feed or import more feed than what we produce in our own state. So naturally, this leaves a situation where we have a few more stumbling stones for farmers within the area. And I believe this is usually true where you have a large concentration of big feedlots. Now, first of all, nearly all farmers produce feed of some kind for livestock. After the feed has been produced, they are financially embarrassed. They can't feed or buy, get financing to feed their own livestock. So naturally, these people are obligated to sell this feed. When they sell this feed, Butch, it is usually on a market that has been established by the feedlots within an area. And this price is usually less than the market price. And they claim to be less than the neighboring state. Of course, they will they use this to, in order to be able to buy cheap feed. But yet at the same time, when they buy your neighboring state's feed, they will buy it for as little as they can, in a lot of instances even less, because their neighboring state has too much corn too. And down there, they're giving it away. They use this, don't they, as kind of a leverage to put the pressure on the people in their area to sell a little cheaper to them? This is true, Butch. Uh, although at the same time, I may sound like I am condemning uh, our big feedlots, it's quite the contrary. We've got to recognize these people that are uh, operating your large feedlots. These people are intelligent. They are just merely taking advantage of the stumb stumbling blocks that the farmer has hasn't been able to get over. I'd like to, at one point, just a moment, uh, the stumbling block, I see for coming for them in the near future, a stumbling block for them also, because they're going to have nobody out here producing the mm -hmm. feed if they break the farmers, but they're producing it now. Wouldn't you say this is about mm -hmm. right? This, this is true. Uh, I think an easy way to do away with this, this uh, particular situation, uh, is do as the, the feeder, the big feeder has done. He is throwing away his, his wishbone and he's using his backbone. And uh, this is a way in order that the farmer uh, is in, can put himself within, in a position in order to get his cost of production for what he does produce. By banding together, all of those cattle feeders could get a price. They would be bigger than any of the chain stores or any of the processors that buy from them and they're entitled for a price too. So this is the reason that more and more of those are learning the NFO story and what it can mean to them and filling out membership applications in the National Farmers Organization. And we hear more and more of this all the time. They're changing their attitude. And somebody uh, remarked about that before the program started here. I don't know which one of you fellows it was. Who was it wanted to speak on that I'll particular take, thing? I'll take that. We'll have to be brief because we've yeah. got 10 minutes left. It's, uh, I was at the Cattlemen's Association convention just a week ago, and they are just as concerned about in the cattle industry as the farmers are. I w I'd like to put this out for the public. For every animal that grades choice, heifer or steer, the American cattle industry is pumping $100 per head into the economy. Somebody along the line has lost a hundred dollars. I don't mean some individual, the grain grower, the, the calf producer, the feeder. They have lost a hundred dollars. And all they can talk about is we've got to organize, we've got to get bigger, we've got to concentrate. Of course, they were just talking cattle, and I don't think that'll ever work for the simple reason. If it, we got to the
cattle end of it and really got profitable, everybody would be in the cattle business. But if we take an overall picture and let live and live and let live be the motto, I believe then the cattle industry would hold its own, the farmers would hold their own, each man do as he wanted to do out there with this piece of land. And I'm also concerned, they was also concerned, and so are we, about these guys joining these organizations, and that's all. That doesn't do any good. We've got to have participation. We've got to stick together. We've got to get it done. I think it was real significant this year at this particular convention that you mentioned that Orrin Lee Staley, national president, of the National Farmers Organization was one of the guest speakers of that organization. And I think this is significant. More and more of the farm groups are working together. And as you pointed out there, if everybody got in the cattle fattening business, who would raise the calves or the feeder stock? Now, we're going to call on Virgil Sprigg, uh, better known as Swede. Uh, and I'd like the camera to move in over there uh, after it gets going a little bit. We have a, an article out of a newspaper uh, showing what happens to the profit on a steer? Who gets it? Virgil? Well, thank you, Butch. Uh, I don't know. It's a possibly the sickest industry in the world today is agriculture. I think it proves it by only three nations, Australia, New Zealand, and United States, having any food available to export. Well, Canada has some, too. And Canada has some. But from the Mexican uh, border on north. But it's uh, the sick part of the industry is the man producing can't make a living and cannot hold this together and cannot keep other industries from moving in and taking over. Uh, your production of all commodities in the agriculture industry is at a sick point as far as cost of production, of anything that you can make a living out of. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the feedlots. There's nothing wrong with the quality of feed produced. I think uh, Mike Servey's journal uh, come out with the answer, especially to the beef end of it. Uh, this was printed in Denver, Colorado, Wednesday, January the 11th. Chains make huge beef profits. Hikes price, $188 on each carcass. Well, in short, it's a supermarket sold for $418 beef that cost them $228. That isn't all. They sold the beef, collected the money before they ever paid the supplier. Now, the carcasses on which supermarkets were making a gross profit of up to $190 a piece are the same cattle on which producers and feeders lost up to $40 a piece. So uh, I think that most people that read the Denver Post, a very noted rancher in our state, Wad Hinman, he stated in the Empire section of the Denver Post last Sunday, he says, I think we are assured, and I quote, I quote his article here, I think if we were assured of a 30 to 32 cent market on these seven to eight hundred pound steers and maybe thirty to forty on these steer calves we could get along i don't say you'd be as well off as any other business but you could make ends meet now that's coming from a man that's been in the ranching business for a good many years and the industry as a whole it's uh, the marketing agencies for it. Uh, the fewer cattle that's making the top price on a quotation, on a quoted market, uh, on a day, on a particular day, well, there's probably 10% of them make top. The rest of them are bought anywhere from, oh, $2 a hundred less in between there. I'd like to inject one point here, uh, Swede. I recently attended a meeting in Washington, D.C., called <coughs> by the Secretary of Agriculture of different groups from all over rural America, all over America, I should say, and they pointed out that they're really concerned. Assistant Secretary of Agriculture George Marin pointed out, and he says, unless there are substantial increases to be made in the livestock prices in the near future, the public is really going to suffer. 
There isn't going to be enough meat to go around. What do we do about it? I'd like the camera to come over and on the <coughs> map of the United States here and take a look, a brief look, at what we're doing about it through the NFO, the National Farmers Organization. We bring you, in many of rural areas of America, a program known as U.S. Farm Report. And all those stars on that, that uh, map will indicate, the big stars indicate, a half-hour television show once every week. The smaller stars, you can't see the color, of course. We have about 60 of those half-hour programs. We have 12 15-minute live television programs every week. We have 150 radio programs every week telling rural America's story, telling everyone that we'll all profit by fair farm prices as we did in the past. Let's take one quick minute to look at what took place in World War II. Farm prices were froze in balance with the rest of society, and we had the most prosperous time ever in the history of these United States. Now, let's get back on that map of the United States again. I want to cover the area that we're already over, organization-wise. Start in there in New York City area, where the stars are there to over there on the map, and you can go clear across the United States to Denver, Colorado, with the exception of a small portion of counties in the state of Pennsylvania. All of those counties are organized in NFO. Farmers joining together, filling out a certificate of friendship on paper, showing their willingness to work with other farmers in their area to get a price for what we have to sell. And that's what NFO is all about. And we would like to encourage all other farmers to join with us, support our efforts, join our organization, support our efforts, and get a price for rural America, a price that will preserve our private enterprise system that has made America great. By private enterprise system, I mean this includes everybody in their own business, such as merchants in town, uh, all types of business people, farmers, corporations, the entire thing, so that it could be owned by the individuals. And that for today is something to think about, really be concerned about, because if the economy goes on down the line and we lose this private enterprise system, the family farm structure of agriculture in America, the thing, the type of agriculture that made America greater than any other, any other nation in the world. Won't you join the NFO and support our efforts now before it's too late? Thank you for listening. U.S. Farm Report has presented observation of feedlots in the western states. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at the same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking and a new generation of farmers. Mm -hmm.